few words. Oh, okay. I was just reminding the young lady that her emphasis was on few words. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to all of you ladies and gentlemen. First and foremost, I wish to thank Mr. Talib Karim, Professor Shiraz and all the faculty members of IOBM for having extended this great invita invitation to be part of these proceedings for second year in continuity. Uh, I think it's a great service done to the community and to the basically business environment to be able to organize such uh, facilities where largely you share experience and you share views. Uh, not necessarily that uh, one benefits from everything that is said across, but uh, it allows for generation of at least some thought in the mind in terms of what we wish to do with ourselves and where do we head, both as an individual and as a nation. Uh, don't be intimidated by the papers that I've pulled out. Uh, I'll still stick to the lady's recommendation of a few words, uh, but that would be what about? Ten minutes? Okay. Thank you very much. I take my own time. Uh, Professor Shiraz was very kind when he extended the invitation. He said to me that uh, I leave it entirely to you to choose the subject that you wish to speak on. And I said to him that how about talking about governance? Uh, he said, yes. I said, how about governance and leadership? He said, looks good. And then I said, can I put in also morality and ethics into it? He said, that sounds perfectly fine. And uh, two days later, I called him and I said, have you printed the brochures? He said, yes. I said, oh, God, what have I done to myself? Talk on this subject. Reminded of the fact that three condemned prisoners, one a Japanese, the other a Britisher, the third, an American. The judge calls him in and says, before you are put to the guillotine, what's your last wish? He first asks the French, French being very nationalistic, he said, I would like to hear my national anthem before I'm put to the gallows. He said, okay. Then I asked the Japanese, he said, what's your last wish? He said, I want to hear for the one more time uh, the lesson on the art of Japanese management. When the Britisher's term, turn came to say what was his last wish, he said, I would like to be hanged before the Japanese because I can't take it any further. Governance is a subject that has been so widely spoken about and has become a cliche word internationally and uh, in the context of our own country, we seem to talk about it and blame everything and dump it on the word governance. Um, do we really understand it? Do we really know what it means? Is it a certain body of rules and regulations that we are talking about? Or is it something to do with internal behavior? Is it something to do with the way we think and act? What is governance all about? And then when you talk of morality and ethics, are these antithesis to the concept of governance is something that we need to ponder and think. Uh, it is desirable, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen that uh, when we talk of uh, leadership, it is a foregone conclusion in the minds of many people that the leader ought to be one who would be above bold in terms of both morality and ethics. Leaders of substance, as you can see from history, who have stood out and made a name and mark for themselves, have always had something beyond, something beyond of what they could perform, i.e. a very strong ethical, moral, spiritual foundation of thought on which they built their lives. I would like to first begin off by taking the example of our own uh, father of the nation, uh, Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Uh, a man who was committed, did he need to be told what governance is? Was he to be reminded about how he needs to operate in a given environment? Did he have to be reminded of what ethical standards the society of Pakistan must have or he should follow? The examples are replete. Read his life history. Uh, read his book. And uh, the other day when I quoted about his, uh, at one of such functions, I quoted about his... Uh, a refusal to partake of tea in cabinet meetings uh, 
where the governor of Sindh was the chief guest and by virtue of protocol, uh, the governor has the last laugh, no, sorry, the last word. And uh, he refuted and he said no such incident happened. And then when we were taking a group photograph, I was standing next to him and I reminded, I said, Governor, have you read Hector Bolitho? That's the first authentic biography of Mr. Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Please read it and you would not refute what I'm saying. Uh, Mr. Jinnah stood very strongly on the principles of honesty, integrity. A Hindu client of his engaged him for a case in the Bombay presidency. He won the case for the client. At a certain agreed feast, they had agreed to do the case. Having won the case, the Hindu client came back to him and he said to Mr. Jinnah, that thank you very much for putting up a great fight at the courts and thank you for winning me the case. Uh, I had agreed to pay you 20,000, but since I'm delighted, I offer you and he placed another 20,000 on the table. Mr. Jinnah stared at him and he said, pick up the packet and leave my room. I don't accept money. I accept money for what I perform, what I'm expected to do. I was expected to win this case for you. That's what I've done. Uh, how many of us can rise to that occasion is a question that we need to ask before we talk of governance. It is all about personal behavior. Buddha was once asked, Prince Siddharth was once asked by one of his disciples, what is the right action? And Buddha, without battling his eyelid, he said, anything that your mind comes up when it is composed of compassion. Compassion is a virtue. Compassion is something that leadership must possess. Only day before yesterday I was reading about uh, Muhammad Tukluk's son who was running Delhi and he was known for his generosity, great amount of generosity and a sense of justice that nobody could challenge. And yet every day at the entrance to his palace, there would be at least five or six dead bodies lying. Contrast. Absolute contrast. He was generous when it came to justice. But when it came to observing rules and regulations, he was absolutely intolerant. I don't know if it's a good combination to have. Nelson Mandela, after 29 years of being interred, he chose to come out and say, I wish to forgive all those people who are responsible for this. That's an attitude too. That leads to governance, if you would please understand and appreciate. It is critically important, ladies and gentlemen, that we do not lose sight we should not lose sight because of the fact that the dilemma in the minds of many people is that what is it that creates good governance? As if there is a reason to have bad governance, governance has to be only good. You can't have bad governance and you can't have principles of bad governance. You can only have principles of good governance. Consequently, how is it that people either they get to an office through corruption or is it the office that corrupts the individual? It's a dilemma that no management scientist has been able to resolve thus far because the consequences of both are available for us in the political history and the corporate history where people rise to a certain degree in the hierarchy and that's when they start to display their internal upbringing. Sometimes it is not so good. Sometimes it's not in conformity. And therefore it becomes extremely difficult. What is it that drives us to have a set of laws, a set of rules and regulations? At three o'clock in the morning, if you stop by against a red light, you know that there are cameras, you know that there is no policeman watching you. You can easily break the light and proceed with your journey. But you choose to stay back 
That is internalization of governance standards in your own self. Unless and until we do that, how can we expect any legal framework to provide us with governance? Fear factor works only to a degree. Give a little freedom to those societies that operate in a fear factor, they go astray, they go berserk, they become most unmanageable. China lived by the rule of fear, most Chinese, for good 30-40 years after their independence. Now that have received a certain degree of independence, you find them observing discipline because it has been inculcated, imbibed over a period of time. So the generations that are coming in now are attuned to following certain standards. We as a nation, we have come up with legislative formulas for putting in good corporate governance in place. We have the SCCP putting up the corporate code of governance. And if you have read that, what does it basically mean? At the end of the day, it is essentially, ladies and gentlemen, a single element called the conflict of interest. In any exercise that you indulge in, in your life, at your workplace, at your home, you find it conflicting with the standards of your thought process that is built as a result of your upbringing based on social principles, religious principles, and the principles that you imbibe from others. If it is in conflict with that, then please do evaluate and see whether it is legitimate to do such an act, whether it is permitted by to remain in conformity or non-conformity of your own beliefs. I would like to invite your attention to the fact that uh, Julius Caesar, when he used to go on conquest of lands and nations, he was extremely careful. When he would get a prisoner of war, he would ensure from his generals that they are protected and their lives are saved. Okay, a man who goes on killing people to acquire land, but once he gets the prisoners of wars, he wants their lives to be restored, to be kept. At one point in time, there were so many such people in the land that they decided to build a temple for Caesar, and they called it clemency. Clemency is a word which is a synonym with mercy. Now, the same very Caesar has a rebellious adopted son called Brutus. Brutus decides to join those who wish to rebel against Caesar. And when he slew Caesar, he said something in which Shakespeare has put in beautiful words, in my personal opinion. I loved him because he was a great fascination. I honor him because he's a valiant individual. I value him because he was a fortunate individual. I slew him because he was ambitious. The root cause, in my opinion, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, is ambition. Unbridled ambition. Unharnessed ambition that takes you to do things beyond the scope of acceptabilities of norms, mores, and cultures. Ambition is a great thing to have, and every single individual, regardless of age, must have ambition. But that ambition must remain confined within the concept of legitimacy. Have you ever pondered where do the various and the millions of fish that are there in the lakes, in the rivers, in the ocean, where do they find their food? What do they eat? Do they go out of the ocean and the lake to search for their food, like you and I have to do, step out of our house and dwellings to do? Or does the fish find its food within its own confines? Always it does, right? Nature has given that inherent quest in a fish to go and find for itself its morsel. 
and therefore they feed on each other. Fish meal is a great product of export and import, right? Why? To catch further fish. Okay, so my question is that if people have stopped to put the fishing line with a bait on it, will all the fish die of hunger if we stop fishing? So what is it that brings the fish to the baiting line? It is now overstepping what nature has given it to quest from within its own area, not to pursue a line having a bait. Bait is the temptation in our lives, ladies and gentlemen. And if we recognize that bait and say, I would disregard the bait and follow my natural, imbibed, inherently, divinely given to me qualities of honesty and trustworthiness, then things would be very different. Last year I was in the Islamic Republic of Germany. Did I say Islamic Republic? Sorry. Federal Republic of Germany. Uh, a similar conference. And the Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, she walked in and she had not a single person following her. She had her bag, which she was holding. She came to the rostrum, pulled out her papers, gave a speech, put them back together amongst the applause of the audience, left the stage and walked away with nobody walking behind her. Just compare that, and I'm talking about governance of leadership, right? Just compare that with our public office holders, the ADC who sits right behind the chief guest has a folder. He comes and places it on the rostrum before the great man would rise from his seat. And he would have his spectacles placed here, short of putting it on him, and give it to him. And he wears the spectacles and gives a speech and leaves his spectacles and the papers and goes back amid applause. And the ADC picks up all those papers. Do you think the Qaeda would ever allow this? Did he ever allow this? I'm sure you've seen his footages of making speeches at various places. Did he have ADCs who would do this for him? None. Never. He never did so. What are we talking about therefore? We are talking of enmeshment of leadership with concepts of personal ethics, personal morality, and personal spiritual standards. And if we can't manage those, then how can in the world we expect people ordinary, like my own self, to operate? The misdoings of a CEO, who is responsible? And you read so many stories in the corporate world, right, about the misdoings of the CEOs. Who is responsible for it? The CEO? Nay. No. He is not alone. The board is responsible for having chosen a man who would look at the bait and not at his natural surroundings to do and achieve something outside the scope. I'm a banker by profession. Whenever any of my colleagues said that he's going to make extraordinary profit, I used to plead with him that, please, let it be ordinary. I don't want extraordinary profits. Because for extraordinary profits, you would do extraordinary efforts. And those extraordinary efforts are largely to harbor outside the scope of legitimacy. So be very mindful. Who do you accuse? What do you say in a situation where in a boardroom a CEO has to make an observation that I'm sorry, gentlemen, by speaking the truth I have brought the issue to a confusion. Honesty is a difficult currency to deal in. But it is a worthwhile a route to adopt in life. And you and I, largely I think, I'm looking at the population of Pakistan, not this audience. 96% of the population professes a particular faith. And they have a similar faith. And that faith demands the highest standards of ethics, the highest standards of morality, and the highest standards of grace and decency. 
do we as a nation do we as a community need to have codes codes for corporate behavior code for social behavior i'm sure you would have heard if you haven't read and in the event you haven't i urge and implore upon you to please read just read the letter written 14 centuries back by hazrat ali karam al lawajo to the governor of egypt in which he enunciates beautifully all the code of governance of his personal behavior how is to react with public how is to deal with justice it is all stated there read the life of hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala anhu look at his administrative abilities do you need a code you don't need a code we were supposed to be teaching the world what code of governance is we have instead become slaves to their codes and their codes are all enshrined on our dictates of our noble religion i was reading a, a book by dirk collier yesterday day before yesterday on the moguls in india and in tuske humayun i find that humayun is writing his principles of governance and guess what he wrote as his first principle of governance you would be shocked but to the pleasure of all the regulators he wrote rotation change the governors after every 2 years that was his first principle of governance why because the longer you allow an individual to occupy a certain place the greater is his influence and when he starts to influence people there is every likelihood that he would start influencing dispensation of justice he would be making compromises on administration rotation is a concept that regulators like the most and somebody in 1570 wrote that so do we need to be told about governance certainly not i entirely disagree i believe that we are very lucky that if it took william pitt in 1757 to say that absolute power corrupts a noble mind we all know about what it means we knew it many centuries back it is a question of having lost our sight um i would just like to conclude by saying that uh, it is the usage of the office and those who occupy the office if they are repositories of simmering volcanoes how can you expect any flowers to bloom around them change them change them that's what we need to require to do uh i would also like to make a mention here of the fact that uh we need to move away we need to move away from a culture of acquiescing to power we must be able to rise and stand for our rights and speak our mind as i said truthfulness is a very difficult currency to deal in but we must all try and impipe that let us stop talking about our grandfathers ladies and gentlemen for a final note let's stop about let's stop talking about our grandparents let's begin by talking about our grandchildren god bless you all